please welcome from Revel Health, Ben Runchy. Is the mic on? Oh, there it is. All right. All right, so the title of this one is uh, Moving the Microservices. Uh, kind of talks about a monolith on the uh, agenda. We've we kind of had one, but it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting story, so we'll go into it. So first, a little bit of what we do here today. Who am I? Who am Revel? Or who is Revel? What do we do? And how do we do that? Uh, and then a little history of uh, our architecture, kind of how we arrived to where, we want, where we're at now and, and why we chose to go there. Um, and then a little bit more about microservices, how we approach them, uh, and how they it just was very an easy fit for Axon, Axon Server. Uh, it's really worked out very well for us. And then finally, a few other things about the details of how we've implemented a few things using Axon at Revel. So if you have any questions, originally I was thinking this was going to be more like what uh, Michael's presentation was on Promontech, where it'd be a room of people smaller than me on the center stage. So if you have any questions, please ask. I had kind of built the uh, presentation with that kind of approach in mind, I guess. Uh, so I've been doing software for over 20 years. Uh, uh, the thing I've found in the last five is how long you've been doing it seems to be matter less and less as the years go on. It's what have you done for me lately? And, or you know, do you have new years of experience versus the same year 20 times over? So that's not that big a deal anymore. Um, two years at Revel, that's just the place I'm at right now. Uh, maybe we'll be somewhere else five years. Uh, and the, probably the biggest thing is it seems like I've been attempting to do something with domain-driven design, services, events for the past 15 years um, in varying shapes and sizes. And it really wasn't until uh, Axon uh, Framework I was able to find it that I felt like you know, a lot of the tools were in place. Prior to that, it was me rolling my own or just kind of convincing people, hey, let's follow these patterns type of thing. So, and then if for some reason you have a uh, question after this, want to ask me about my experiences, uh, please feel free to contact me at the email I've got listed here. So, oh, and then with Axon, uh, you know, been using Framework for about, about two years now coming up on, and Axon Server since the beginning of this year, and we're quickly picking up speed with it here over the last few months as we're putting more and more services. So we've even evolved past what the presentation I'll talk about here today is. So what do we do at Revel? Uh, so we're, uh, the, the marketing uh, approach is we are a healthcare action company is really what it is. So we're trying to really motivate people to do, uh, you know, take some action to help manage their, their, uh, their healthcare. It could be something uh, like going and filling out a survey that the government wants you to fill out because you're on a government program. It could be, hey, please go get your flu shot. And then now recently, we've moved more into helping people manage their uh, chronic conditions, which would be like diabetes, high blood pressure, things like that, where you, know, you taking your medicine or getting to the doctor on a regular basis are things that re we really want, we, everybody would, would like to have happen so that your condition stays under control and we can you know, keep you healthy as long as we can. So we do this by reaching out to people. Uh, right now, we've moved into the world in the last two years of uh, using SMS, email, phone. We'll even send you mail. We'll have somebody call you on the phone. So uh, when I say phone there, it's really IVR. So think of, hello, this is Rebel Health. Please answer these questions, which is not always that appealing. But it's amazing how well it works for people over the age of 70 to get surveys from them when they need to answer questions for us. So, you know, and that'll get into the next line. We're using analytics to determine who's most interested in uh, being reached out to in what ways. So that, uh, you know, one of those things that, you, you know, I hear that on the phone and I want to hang up immediately because I'm just so turned off by the voice and how unengaging uh, it is. But it's working for some people. But other people sending an SMS with a link in it to have them go do what we like is really the way they want to uh, interact with us. Our main customers are insurance companies at this point because they're mandated by law in the United States uh, when they sell a certain policy type to contact the people who've bought the policy. So they can't just go take your money and say thanks and never work on trying to make you healthier. The goal is that those insurance companies need to talk to you and try to keep up with uh, your health and how they can help improve it. And then also doctors, clinics, people like that that are really the flip side of it is 
a lot of hospitals in the United States are moving to a model where they have agreements with insurance companies where they are getting paid not based on how many procedures they do, but based on how healthy they're, they're, they are keeping their patients at that point. So that's a new model in the United States, so that's changing how doctors and clinics are interacting with customers. So our company was founded in 2007, so kind of funny, it was founded like right before the economy in the United States really went down, down the tubes, and they were able to withstand that from being a brand new company. I mean, I was kind of surprised about that, but I think it was because this government mandate had, come in, had arrived, so there was a defined amount of revenue that was going to come in. It wasn't like people could say, no, I don't feel like spending money on that anymore. The government was mandating it, so it worked out. But for about 10 years, the company kind of uh, was about the same size. A few people came, a few people left, but they really had, at that point, one big customer and a couple tinier ones that were there as well. Uh, around 2017, the people who owned it decided we either have to you know, get big or decide to just close up shop. So they found a, a man that I knew, and he said, well, I think we should grow this and, and see what we can do with it. Um, and he very, uh, what we say, forward thinking in terms of where he wanted to go with it and how he thought it could be successful and, uh, and be worth something. So how do we do what we do? Uh, first, like I said, we try to contact people. So we, uh, from our customer, whoever that might be, doctor, health plan, they send us who they want to talk to, and they've already just set up a program, like are we talking to somebody about their health condition, or do they need to fill out a survey, whatever it might be, that's already been defined. So we will, I think I've got a laser here. We will uh, bring them in the door. It's usually a file, a big fat file. Everybody loves file transfer in the healthcare space in the United States still. Um, so they'll come in and we'll determine how we want to talk to them. So we'll use our analytics. So there's a few things and we'll, we'll set up uh, hopefully a unique, what we call contact sequence to how we talk to them. Kind of what order we want to use those different channels. So we'll use analytics to help inform that. Uh, if we've seen you before, then we say, oh, hey, we already talked to Ben. We know he responded at this time using these channels. Let's start with those at the beginning and then move on to other ones. And then there's other times where, hey, we, we think we've seen somebody like you, and that would be you know, where in the world you live or where in the United States for the most part. How old are you? Uh, that type of thing that we'd say, okay, you tend to lean more towards taking texts uh, versus getting a call with our IVR system. So we, we have our contact sequence, we determine it, and then we move over here to this big circle. Here, I'll use this side since you guys don't. Uh, so we just kind of keep walking down it. So we right away try to give them a call or contact them in the first method, give some wait time in between, give them a chance to absorb it, maybe uh, solve the, uh, take the action we've asked. And if that doesn't happen, you know, we move on to the next one all the way through until the con sequence is finished um, at that time. But as you can see, we've got you know, we work with a lot of online vendors. We're sending them, hey, please make contact this person using whatever channel we have. The members would either respond right back to the vendor in the case of like a live agent or a phone call that's right there, they're on the line. But in the case where we sent them a, a link in a, in a uh, text or an email, we need them to come back to our survey. So this is kind of the big area that generates a lot of our events about how did we interact with you? So if we see you the next time, uh, you know, we've got that information uh, captured. Um, what was the duration it took for you to finally respond? Which one did you happen at? So we're able to get down to that point rather than just saying, I tried to talk to you and keeping like updating one record. We have a huge history of how we try to contact you within a given program. So that all comes back here into the, the big circle, the, the vortex, I guess you'd say. And then we're dumping it into the analytics so that we can be informed for the next time. So it's kind of, that's what our cycle is. So if we've talked to you once, we probably know something about you and can use that again for the next time. Uh, there's obvious uh, personal uh, uh, PII, personally identifiable information in there. So it's not like it's something we're sharing with the rest of the world. Um, it's just something we're using for a health plan as they've worked with us at that point in time. So if you came to us from another health plan, we're still deciding, you know, can we reuse data across health plans if you happen to switch, that type of thing. Um, and then finally, we send back the out, whatever the results are, we send those back out to our customer because they need it back in their systems as well for later on, uh, for how they're gonna work with you to keep your health up. So this is what we were at when I arrived. We had something that looked a lot like this. Uh, we, and, and 
the biggest thing here about a monolith is we have one and only one database. Everything is against this database. So, uh, you know, running a report hits the data, that same database that us processing, you know, there's times where we have to contact about a million people in a very short period of time. That's a high load, high load on our system. That's going against the same table. So, and we've got some queries that run against it for these reports that are just incredibly nasty to try to produce the data we need. So we have to be very careful at certain times of the year on our old system how we get this done. Uh, you see, we still have some of the same concepts here. We still have our vendors, but in the old world, we only had voice. We just had automated voice, live agents. We do have mail, but that's less interesting, so we're not going to talk about mail. Um, and then they call back to our APIs. We still had the data in and out, but we didn't have, um, what would I say? Well, let's move forward. So what were our challenges? That shared database, I mean, there's, it was just the, I don't know, about a month ago, somebody ran a report at a certain time of day and it brought the entire thing down to its knees. And ton, you know, tons of problems that ensued. We had to figure out who had decided to one, run what report and uh, get that killed. And uh, a lot of times it's just someone running an ad hoc query that, that can end up doing this. Uh, I think going forward though, uh, we, as we started to look at this, we realized, hey, we don't really have a domain model here. What we have is, are a bunch of tables that act like our domain model, but we don't have any way to enforce business logic really easily across our system. Uh, there is not one central area that was responsible for any one thing. It was really, uh, we decide this box is gonna do that now. Oh, man, and we kinda need it over here. And so we, you know, a lot of copy paste for some of our code going on. Uh, all of those types of things. So it was very something that started at one size and then just kind of organically grew over time. Um, so it, it doesn't really have any real structure that we can lean, fall back on to, to support us. So lots of stored procs, heavy use of that anemic domain model. You know, we go load data up, it's basically a bag of data, and then we throw it around the system at that time. Uh, and then lots of procedural code. I talked about the scaling. And then the other thing that really came into play, uh, there was, there are, are, we've gotten better, but when I first arrived, we didn't have anything really in the way of a CI, CD type uh, practices that we would apply for deploying things. So a lot of what this did was set the stage for this. I don't think this is going to work for us to try to grow this company to where this, you know, the man I spoke about earlier wants to take things. So we decided that, hey, we're going to try to go to some microservices here. The one thing we did get out of all that, we really knew our domain in terms of on paper, but it just was not anything that we had uh, uh, fully expressed in code or could easily take data out of the database and uh, run it through an analytical engine very easily. Those are all things in the last two years that we've really built up on. But we learned a lot from what we had done for those 10 years. So when I arrived, we just, you know, kind of figured out, well, where are we taking this company? So we decided from an architecture standpoint, we had to have a few things that we uh, wanted to go after. So we wanted to build a platform for the next 10 years. So at that point, we were thinking, all right, uh, I think I've talked to a few people today. We didn't want to go after things like your standard DTO pattern, where you know you load up a big bag of data, send it out the APIs because somebody asked for it. They modify who knows what on it, and then they just send it back calling one save method. That totally loses us our ability to say, well, what happened? When did it happen? What changed when? So as you start saying that, you're like, wow, this is all all events. You know, you realize that's really what we're looking for here, um, and. We also wanted to make things small enough that we could react to changes. We could try some things out. We're, we're OK at trying things out. We're not that great, but we're getting better at it all the time. Um, so the stack, we also decided that rather than be on the .NET stack, we uh, went down the Java stack. And uh, I have to say, at the time, I, I didn't really have a feeling either way. We had one man who's like, oh, I know Java. I want to work on that. And I, him and I were the ones starting on this new voyage together at that time. And I said, sounds good. Let's do it. So we went down that path and uh, left the .NET world behind, which in the end was the greatest thing because that's how we ended up being able to leverage Axon uh, at that to get there. So anything on the JVM we're using, we actually have one service in Groovy. We've got almost everything in Kotlin, and we might have something in Java yet still, but it obviously is there because it's the, the basis for most JVM work. Um, and then how do we get from the old world to the new world? Well, we're just going to migrate over time. So uh, I talked about these programs that we run. They all have a defined start and an end date. So as things would end, if we have enough of the features on the new system, 
we'll just bring them over to the new system when they start the next program. We don't have to worry about a middle of the year type of a shift. So it was really, uh, just, it's just a nice landing path to get us over there at that point. So that takes away a lot of the complexity that you might otherwise have to bite off to take something mid-year and move it over. So. so when we go down the microservices path, uh, we had some tenants we went after. Uh, hey, we wanted that single deployable unit. We wanted to keep it as small as possible so the lift uh, would be easy. Uh, we did not want point-to-point -point calls. Right from the start, we'd gotten away from that. So uh, commands, events were big for us right away. Um, just it helps with deployment. You know, A doesn't have to be up for B to be deployed, those types of things. Um, loosely coupled, again, I talked about message-centric. And then respect-bounded context, you know, um, no central database. We wanted every service to have its own data store at that point. Uh, makes it a lot easier. And then no cross-database access. So although we violated that just a little bit in one spot, but we'll talk about that here. So here we are, phase one. What did it look like when we first rolled out our, our implementation of V2 for the first day? So we had uh, you know, our four services here that were transactional, and then we had a new analytics service. So at the time we started, uh, one of the challenges, is the term I'll use, uh, that I kind of ran into was we all knew we liked events, we all liked commands, but we all, me and the other uh, developers we had on staff, had a slightly different view of, well, what, where do you use event sourcing at and uh, Axon events? And where do we just make our own commands and events? So rather than fight that battle right at that, same, at that time, I was feeling like, let's just get started so people can see what's happening here. We can kind of get some traction around things. So as you notice, we only had Axon in one service at that point because that was the service that we knew the best. That was that big swirly circle, the cyclone that we had on the other page. That is the engine that knows, okay, I need to talk to somebody at this time. Oh, they responded, what do I do next? So those events worked out really well, and uh, or it worked well to describe itself in events, I'm sorry. And then once our developers started seeing that, it was real easy for us to say, hey, I need you to build this path here. This command comes in, it raises this event. That event, you need to take this action on. Uh, those types of things. So that it started to really make sense to a lot of our developers at that time. Uh, we started off with Mongo as our event store because at that point, I think Axon DB was just something coming out, but it wasn't mature enough that we, and we didn't know how big this was going to become for us, if it was just going to stay in this box or if it was going to become much bigger. Uh, so uh, we didn't go down that path. We just chose Mongo DB because it was quick and easy. And uh, we use Mongo for all of our other projections at this point. Uh, it, it's just been easy enough. We didn't have any, uh, nobody had a, an affinity towards anything else. And uh, one, we, we did a prototype with Mongo and liked it and st have stuck with it ever since. The area that we really um, put a lot of investment in is the, the Rabbit MQ, SNS, SQS, because how do we get commands and events between our services? This is where I was saying that we didn't really, people didn't really know how they felt about Axon and domain events versus what they were, what, when, what we were calling at the time interdomain events. In other words, I produce something, but it's, uh, you know, I need to make sure it's ready for consumption outside of my bounded context. So I think mentally, we really thought about Axon in terms of, oh, it's only inside the bounded context. To leave would make it very difficult. Um, so this is where we ended up with. And uh, again, our analytics service, sucking in all the events that are going on in the system. And then as you see here, this is where we kind of violated things a little bit. It's reading directly from domain events, but it's just reading the events. So in essence, it's treating it just like an event stream. There's nothing about it that's modifying it. If uh, anything were to change, it, we have all the same challenges of just changing any other event. They're just reading all of our domain events right from the, uh, the collection at that point. So then uh, here's where we're at now. Uh, we've kind of come to the terms that, hey, you know what? A Axon is going to get the job done for all events. I mean, if we have to keep thinking in, in terms of events for everything, uh, we kind of classified how we view events, and I'll get to that at the end of uh, a couple slides on. But if you see, uh, so we created a new service, Service 5, instead of giving names because that would just start to confuse it a little bit. Service 5 is new. Service 2 is a rewrite, so we brought it from over here where it was reading off of uh, SQS Rabbit. It's now using event event store and Axon server to get things done. Our first service, uh, service one, is now consuming events uh, from the other systems. 
and uh, the analytics service is just starting to consume events from Event Store at this time as well. But uh, analytics service is a really big surface area. I've, it's not doing it justice with the size of the box that it is here. The other area that we've done uh, that Axon Server really has helped us out with was that location independence. We were really hell-bent on not having any service know how to go find data from another service uh, for a, just a, a multitude of reasons. But uh, the location independence was really big for us. And once the distributed query bus came out and you could run it through Axon Server, that was another big sell for us about why we should be using this to get things done. So all of our services now don't know how to find where to find it. They just know, hey, I go ask, ask for this from the bus the query bus, and, I, and we get the response back. And that saved us a lot, of, uh, a lot of effort in having to make sure, is this up, is this down? So our deployments have become easier uh, at that, uh, from not having to care about, you know, did we accidentally make some dependency between two services that, that we haven't found yet, those types of things. And we still have uh, Rabbit, SQS, SNS in there, just as we go through and rewrite things. Uh, they're going to eventually die off here in the next three to six months. So ultimately, our desired state is obviously that, hey, we have Axon Server as a centerpiece for everything. Uh, we don't have any more RabbitMQ. We don't have SNS, SQS, unless we have a, a legitimate different need uh, to go down that path. But if it's within our domain, uh, we'd like it to stay in Axon Server if possible. All of our services will eventually be using events, uh, Axon Server for event store, query bus, you know, distributed command handler or distributed command bus, all of those things, it solves a lot of those problems for us. So that's ultimately where we're trying to go to. Um, so some of the implementation details, and this is what I was talking about. So we have inside events versus outside events. And I think I've heard this from two other people today. I think Michael talked about it. And then, uh, I, sorry, I can't remember your name, but the man who was talking about day two of Axon, uh, running Axon, same type of thing. So inside events, these are fine-grained. They only have enough for us to update a projection. We haven't tried to you know, bulk them up with all the, all the state of the system at that time. Outside events, those are more the coarse-grained ones. We're intending these to be subscribed to by the other services as they would need to know about what's going on. Uh, and even within outside events, we have two styles. We have, hey, this is a status change. And then we have other ones that are really hey, here's the whole set of what just went on at this point in time. So it's kind of, uh, we have point in time uh, outside events and then status change events. So a status change event is really saying, hey, something changed. You know how to execute the query and come back and ask for it. So, because you may or may not care about it at this time. And since it was some, those are events that can happen just rapidly a whole bunch of times, we didn't want to keep, you know, throwing a bunch of data in there that nobody really cared about. That it just seemed like a complete waste of our effort and storage space, not like we're, you know, have any Y2K problems, but uh, we just felt like that just didn't make sense to make a huge event that, that could change over time. We felt that would be more a query, uh, query bus type of impl implementation that would help us out. So again, query bus, avoiding point to point. Uh, some of the challenges that we had, but 4.2 is out now, so I wrote this the other day, and then looking at 4.2, I haven't had a chance to look at it, but uh, I have one app and needing to consume events from multiple contexts. That was just a little bit of work uh, to go in and dig through some of the uh, innards of uh, how Axon starts up with uh, the Spring Boot Starter Pack to get that going for us. But it wasn't anything overly complex to figure out. You just have to mentally get, get around, okay, what would need to happen here? Um, so that's where you have, you know, you're working in a context, but you need to re read from many. The re remaining work, we have the same issues that other people have around a dead letter queue. Now, we really don't run into this that often. I, I think because the domain, as we've been moving it over to V2, we, we know it pretty well. We kind of expect what we want to have happen. Um, so I don't have too many challenges. But we do run into them sometimes, and they just get logged, and it's an error. We go hunt it down and figure out what we want to do to, to resolve that issue. So some of our uh, the details on Axon Server. Uh, we're running an enterprise three-node set. It's just one cluster. It's not anything more than that. Uh, it's all at AWS using dedicated instances. We don't, haven't tried any uh, container magic or anything like that to get these running. Uh, we kind of treat it the same way we, did. we have databases where, I don't know if anybody tried to scale a database on, back in uh, VM land, VMware land. It just never really seems to always work that great, or at least I've never had success with it. 
So we just ran it right on the EC2 instance itself. It's pretty easy to install, set up, and configure. There's no real challenge to that. Uh, so some of the remaining work we have with Axon Server, though, is uh, we really want to get in the habit of rotating our keys, so that's baking how we deploy and how we talk to Axon Server at deployment time to rotate keys, so we, we're always rotating them versus assigning one and using it for, you know, till who knows when. Uh, that helps us out with a security standpoint. One of the other areas that as we've started to use it more and more, uh, we have ran into things like, what's happening here? I, I can't tell, you know, and then it takes us a little bit of time, so finding those right metrics, what matters to us, uh, how, how big a load we have on it, uh, running some more load tests with it and taking those metrics in. We still have work to do down that path uh, to, so we can have the right monitors and alerts. And then the final one, and I think this one has also had something maybe addressed in 4.2 that I haven't had a chance to look at, but you know, the s segments, scaling them up, scaling them down, figuring out that type of stuff as the number of nodes we have maybe has to increase or decrease over time. Uh, that's another one that we're still working on, but again, uh, every time we send an email to support, uh, I get a response pretty quick, so I'm not too worried about uh, us figuring that out. I think it's the difference is what works for us, you know, kind of uh, as Allard always says, well, it depends. You know, there's not a one-size-fits-all for uh, how you're going to implement this for you and your company. So I think that might be all I had. So thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Anybody? No? All right. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. The outside events, did you say that you are publishing events that aren't? Oh, hey. Hello. <laughs> uh, are you saying you're not storing those events on the event store, the events that are outside notification events that you expect a query to come back into the system yeah. for? Uh, no, we store them on the event store because we still consider them part of our event stream. So if somebody wanted to use that event, to uh, solve some problem later on. Uh, really, our analytics team, we're always thinking, is this something we're going to need for some analytical ID, uh, idea later on? So it's very rare that we would ever, that going forward, uh, we do not want to produce something that doesn't live on the event stream or in, a, in the event store because exactly that. We may come up with a new model and we have to go all the way back to the beginning of time, consume all those. So we've been trying to use Event Store for everything we do. It's just that the amount of data we may or may not put in the event uh, makes it easier uh, or more challenging for an external, uh, external service than the one that produced it to use it. So really what we wanted to do was avoid, if a service needs a read-only copy of something to get their processing done, but they'd never make any modifications to it, they'll always be informed of a, of a modification from the, the service that owns or is responsible for that, uh, that entity. Uh, that's the time where we're thinking about it, that it would just make it easier for them to, to take it and store it at that particular moment uh, versus having to capture all the events and know what to make sense of them and, and build their own projection at that point. Uh, we just felt like they don't really need to take that on. They just need to be informed of what's happening here at a given point in time uh, based on that status where a status is raised, come query for it, or, hey, this is exactly a point in time uh, uh, event and here you, you have it right now, and you can work with it at this point in time, so. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah? Uh, you mentioned inside and outside events, but you also had the term. You mentioned inside and outside events, but you also had the term domain events. Yep, oh, so uh, we're just further classifying what is a domain event. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're if we take the term domain event and say everything's a domain event, uh, we probably make it hard to distinguish, okay, do I need to, s to subscribe to all these small events to make things happen? Uh, do it, can I make it a bigger one? I, I think the term domain event to us is really a more uh, generic concept, and so we're trying to probably more refine it if, I, if you're based on how you're asking the question. Didn't even think about it from that perspective, but I guess so many conversations have ensued, we've kind of moved on to that. So. Anybody else? No. All right, thanks.